All right, we are beginning our catechism class, our catechism class. This is our first meeting. You should have, hopefully, the book I'm showing you on the camera here. This is Light for Life. Light for Life. Good, I can see it there. Jonathan's holding his up. Seraphim's got his. So Light for Life. If you don't have this, it's a book you want to pick up in order to follow along as we go through a three-volume set. There are three volumes to this. Volume one, volume two, and volume three. And I'll show those to you right now. Here's what volume two looks like. It's red. Light for Life, part two. And then Light for Life, part three. It's green. Okay, so volume one is brown. Volume two is red. Volume three is green. All right. They are uh, produced by a group of scholars from the Ruthenian, Ukrainian, Melkite churches. Uh, they um, and so they represent kind of a general approach to the Byzantine tradition in catechesis, and they are very well done. So we're going to be working through those books tonight. We're going to look at Volume One, and as with all books, I'll begin by uh, explaining to you to make sure that you want to read them carefully, okay? There's a lot of great stuff in here. And one of the things that American readers will typically do, so as a teacher, I'm going to give you a little, little uh, teacher lecture here. What you want to do when you open up a new book is you want to look at the cover. First thing, look at the title. Okay, so you're going to, a speed reader, a professional reader, these are the things they do, okay? So you think, well, that's going to take extra time. No, a professional speed reader, okay? People who read books, you know, as a profession, they zip through a, 100 pages in five minutes. This is what they do. They start out by looking at the cover. They look at the title really carefully. They look at the fact that it's one volume. So this is volume one of other volumes. So that tells them something about the book. And it says, The Mystery Believed. Okay, so the title, Light for Life, subtitle, The Mystery Believed. So it's going to begin with talking about The Mystery Believed. And then the second volume is The Mystery Celebrated. And then the third volume is The Mystery Lived. So what that gives you before you even approach the text is the overarching schema of the authors. You're, gonna, you're getting inside the head of the authors. This is why they give you titles and subtitles to help you with this. They're not just catchy for marketing. So the mystery believed, that's step one, belief. Step two, the mystery celebrated. That's going to be sacramental celebration mainly. And then the mystery lived. How does that go on in our life? So entrance into the, the catechumenate basically is, is volume one. And then the process of becoming a, a member of the church is volume two. And then the process of living as a member of the church is volume three. Another way to say it. Okay? This is very helpful to make sure that when you look at the, any, type of, uh, any type of series of books or any book, you're going to look at the titles. Then what you want to do is look at the back of a book. Okay, So on this one, you can look at the back. And you'll usually get a little summary or some sort of statement by some scholar or famous name that will sometimes give you a little bit of an insight into the book. This is invaluable time spent, trust me, as you're reading a book. Then the next thing you want to do is open up the front and look at the cover, the cover page. You look at uh, any information you can gather. Ah, God with us publications. And you learn a little about who they are. You can skim through that. Then you look at the table of contents. So you can see where the book's going. Spend a few minutes looking at the table of contents, okay? And then uh, there's some acknowledgement, acknowledgements and some technical information about what translations from the Bible are being used. Very helpful information. Otherwise, you'll be scratching your head halfway no book. And then here's the one that nobody will do. What is extremely valuable is if there is a prologue or an introduction, a preface, you want to devour it. Because the prologue or introduction or preface, and I love books, so I find a preface and an introduction, oh, you devour that section. Because this is going to give you the cliff notes, the outline, the basic themes of what you're going to be reading. 
so that you're not, otherwise you're gonna have to figure those things out halfway into the book. You'll start to realize what the themes are, right? So you want to spend 10 minutes before you start reading a book, reading all the introductory information that's in the book, okay? That's my little lecture from the teacher personality in me, okay? So make sure you do that. We are uh, going to begin then, having said that, with the prologue, which is the basically a summary of the whole book. So you have a summary of the book, and then you can jump into part one, chapter one. Okay, so let's begin that. So if you turn to page one, page one of the book, the prologue. Again, a lot of times you'll see prologue. Oh, where's chapter one? Let me get to the heart of it. Well, you're going to miss it. You're not going to really grasp chapter one unless you've read the prologue carefully. Okay, so what I'm going to do here now is I'm going to, and I recommend having a highlighter out. I'm going to be giving you key words or sentences in each of the paragraphs that are helpful for you in your reading of the book, okay? So I'm not going to rehash what's in the book. I'll summarize a few things for you. But what I want to help you do is learn to read this book for all it's worth. And the way you're going to do that is by highlighting key sentences or key words. And I have already done that for you going through the book, and I'll point those out to you as we go. And then you this week can then go reread the chapter. Hopefully you've already read it. If not, you'll read it for the first time maybe. You can reread the chapter and zero in on those key themes. Okay? So that's the basic, our basic program. So we're looking at volume one, Light for Life. This is part one, The Mystery Believed. And we're looking at the prologue now. This is page one. And like I said, you want to have a highlighter out or maybe a pencil or something to do some underlining. It begins by telling us, I have come so that they may have life and have it to the full. This is a quotation from John chapter 10, verse 10, and really is a summary then of the whole book and really all three volumes. That first line, you want to highlight that. John chapter 10, verse 10, I have come so that they may have life and have it to the full. Underline the words life and full, okay? Jesus came to give us life. And you might say, I already have life. I know a Buddhist friend of mine who lives next door, and he's got life. He's alive. Yes, he has basic natural life. It's not in a perfect state, as all of us are imperfect, but he's got, the, he's got life, right? But he's not, he doesn't have everything. He doesn't have, he's not able right now to live life to the full. Okay, to live life to the full. And in Jesus is where we find that fullness of life, where we experience what God intended us to really have, to experience when he first created us and made us as his children to dwell with him for all eternity in the garden of paradise, the garden of Eden. That was his purpose, for us to live in joy and happiness and pleasure and the experience of this world and all of its beauty with him. And so without him, we experience a fallen world in our fallen nature. And so we experience life, but not in the fullness, not what he intended for us. And so the book begins by telling us that Jesus came to give us life and life in the full, quoting John chapter 10, verse 10. What does it mean by that? It's going to unpack that now in this chapter, or in the, in the prologue in the first chapter as well. The next paragraph, look at, all of, look at the second, uh, second paragraph there, last line. As the Bible says, to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the power to become children of God. Look at that, John 1.12, John 1.12, quoting from the RSV there. So he gave power to become children of God. So what does it mean to have life in God? It means to come into relationship with him, but it's not something new so much as a restoration of something old. We were created as the image and likeness of God. Now, if you look in the mirror, you're going to see an image of your parents, right? You'll look like your parents. You may act like them for better or for worse, right? So, so the, we are like our parents. We act like them. We look like them. That's, that's in our, the, the heart of our nature. 
We are made in the image and likeness of God. And what, that mean, what the Bible means by that is that we are God's children. And so Jesus came to restore the relationship of mankind to a filial relationship. We were once estranged, living outside the household of God. But God has come. He's reached out to bring us back into that originally familial relationship that we were created for. Okay, the third paragraph, the third paragraph, faith is a dynamic with many levels of meaning on which we may reflect. We may best begin by thinking of the faith of St. Maximus the Confessor who saw it. Faith is true knowledge, the principles of which are beyond rational demonstration, for faith makes real for us things beyond intellect and reason. What is he saying there? He's, what is faith? Sometimes you'll think of faith as something just blind belief. I trust this thing. Well, typically you trust something because you have reason for trust. You have reason for faith. So, for example, if uh, you um, see a man down on the, by the lake casting his fly rod, right? You see what he does, and he, he pulls it back, and he reels in, and then he casts it out again. Now, when he pulls it back, and he gets into a certain position, you know what he's going to do next, don't you? you say, oh, yeah, he's going to cast. Are you sure you know that? How do you know that? We say, well, I saw him do it before. Yeah, but rationally, you do not know he's going to cast again, do you? It could be that he may suddenly stop mid-swing, and start, you know, skipping or something down the shore, right? So how do you know he's going to do it? Because you've seen the pattern. You've seen the pattern. Now, here's the deal. You might say, so then when we say that, oh, I know he's going to cast again, we don't really know it, do we? Because he might not. Yeah, that's the case when you're watching a fisherman, right? When you're watching a fisherman, that's the case. However, when you're watching God, God always does the same thing. God is immutable. This is one of those important principles of theology. God does not change. This is so critical to understand. The God, the Judeo-Christian God that we worship, does not change. This is so important. Many people begin by thinking about God as a being which changes. If you begin that way, you're going to think of a pagan God. God does not change. You change, but God doesn't change. And so what that means is that God is perfectly predictable. If you've seen him do one thing, you know he's going to do it again. If you've seen him do it this way, you know he's going to do it that way again. Perfectly predictable. God never changes. He's always doing the exact same thing all the time. He's not doing one thing and then later on he does this and over here he does that. No, he is always doing the exact same thing. Immutable, unchangeable. Okay? So very important. So what that means is that when you know what God has done, then you can know what he will do now and in the future. That's called faith. That's called faith. Okay? Very different from watching the fishermen on the shore. The fisherman, a man is, is mutable. He changes. Uh, a fisherman may, mid-swing, highly unlikely that mid-swing, might stop, snap his fishing pole over his knee, and go skipping down the shore. Maybe he'll dive into the water. You have no idea. Now, you might say, no, no, I mean, likely, very likely, yes, very likely. But with God, we're talking about something else. And here's the problem when we come to modern science. Modern science will say, you can, you can measure things, you can see patterns, but you cannot know what happens next, okay? And what they mean by that, though, is they're applying that information to the fishermen on the shore, as I just said. The problem is that they don't begin with the understanding that God is immutable. And so when we come to the action of God, we can know what he will do in the future because we know what he did in the past. So what does that mean? It is critical for us. If we're going to have a strong faith that is a knowledge of God, what he has 
doing now and will do in the future, what it means is we have to know what he did in the past. Our faith must rest on reason. Our faith must rest on reason. We are not called as Christians to blind faith. You know, just this idea that, well, God will do this because I believe he's going to do it. It's crazy. Nor are we called to pure rationalism. That is, what God did in the past, I know what he did, but I don't know what he'll do in the future because I can't predict, I can't look in the future. No, when you're talking about God who is immutable, then you can, through faith, that is trust in him, know if you believe he is immutable, then you can know what he will do in the future. But the only way you'll know what he's doing in the future is if you know what he did in the past. And this is why it's so critical to know the past, so critical to know salvation history, what God has done so that you will know what he will do. Okay? All right, so then, page... Two, don't worry, we'll speed up. We're going to take this much time here. Uh, page two, we grow in faith. You see that subtitle, we grow in faith, halfway through the page? The scriptural word for the way the believer puts one faith in God is is. This is a Greek preposition, is, into. Our Lord told the apostles to baptize into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 19. Accordingly, at every baptism, we sing, all of you who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ like a garment. And this is Galatians 3.27. Baptism into means, most accurately, that we belong to him, in whose name we have been baptized. We more than belong, we become, highlight that, we become Christ, as if we were Underline, embraced by him. We express a faith that is more than just a belief and a set of propositions. It is a process of becoming, underline that, a process of becoming what we believe, of moving toward union, towards union with the Trinity, to whom we belong by baptism. By baptism. Okay, so what that means is that faith is not simply a trust or an expectation of a future event. It's an action that we do, an exercise. We, we do this, and by that, we move into closer relationship to that in which we believe. Right? So as we grow in relationship through trusting in God, knowing what he's done and know what he'll do now in the future, what we're doing is we're, we're restoring the relationship we once had with him. We are moving closer in that filial relationship which we were originally created because a child trusts their father. Right? A child trusts the parent. The parent is the caregiver, the one that has unconditional love for the child and cares for them, changes the diaper, teaches them how to walk, feeds them. While the child looks up to the parent, looking for help and assistance and direction. Sometimes when the parent doesn't give them what they want, they get upset and they scream and cry. But the parent still has their best intention in mind, even though the child doesn't always necessarily understand. It. That's a critical uh, um, image to understand, of course, our relationship with God. Okay. Uh, so make sure you highlight that paragraph there. I'm really those key terms there. Paragraph, or page three. So faith is something we, we believe in the future, in the, in the present, what God will do. But look at the second paragraph here. It says, yet there is an intellectual side to faith, a dimension of the reasonableness or openness to logical expression, as I just said. We can express our perception of what faith reveals through word symbols, though these words remain inadequate to express the fullness of this reality. Thus the church proclaims the mystery of God in specific terms in its profession of belief called the Nicene Creed. So the critical, someone says, what does it mean to be a Christian? What are the basic beliefs of Christianity? Well, the early Christians laid this out for us in what's called the Nicene Creed. The early councils, they laid this out. What was it? It was the baptismal creed. What they would say at the, at the baptism, before they were baptized, do you believe? And they would recite the creed. 
They would recite these things, and they say, okay, you believe that? Then they would baptize in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they entered in. Okay? So does the creed, the creed, it, it, it doesn't give us all of the details of faith, but it's the basic, it's the cliff notes. It's the skeleton of our understanding of salvation history. What has God done? Salvation history, what he will do now in the future, faith in him, of course. Okay, then, faith as communal. You see that subtitle, faith as communal. The church has explicitly recognized the freedom involved in our acceptance of the gift of faith. A person can accept the fullness of faith only within the context of the community. Highlight that word community. But one must accept it freely as an individual. So there's an individualistic and communal aspect to this. The modern age, highlight this, on the other hand, has accepted a purely individualistic understanding of faith. Real faith, they say, is seen as a personal quest for the meaning of existence, which is conducted in isolation. The journey of a lonely creature seeking union with God, the creator. The faith thus arrived at is viewed as completely subjective, a private matter whose truth is not important to anyone else. Right? Have you ever heard that kind of thing? That's your faith, not my faith. Right? What that means is truth doesn't really matter. There is no really real truth. Uh, it's just what you believe is important and hope you feel good about it. Look at the next paragraph. This notion of rugged individualism, which really comes from Protestantism more than anything, Individual faith or private Christianity would simply be unknown in a traditional mentality. The religion of the scriptures and the fathers, the Judeo-Christian tradition, is a corporate, highlight that word corporate, rather than an individual experience. God deals with individuals, to be sure, but he deals with them as part of a community. For faith is rather a gift of God first to the community of the church and through the community to each individual person within it, right? How do you experience faith? St. Paul says faith comes by hearing. Well, how do you hear from the community, right? The community of believers. Even those believers, prophets, hermits, monastics, that God has called to a maybe an isolated uh, uh, life temporarily whose most exclusive and personal vocation called them forth from the life of the community, were regularly sent back to the community with the fruit of their, their solidary experience. So Abraham was called from the nations for the sake of the nations, Genesis chapter 12, right? He said, verse 3, through your seed all the nations will be blessed. The people of Israel were called as a unique nation before God so that all nations could become one with God. Next paragraph, coming to such a living faith may involve a personal search, but even that quest arises from the operation of God in the depths of our being under the guidance of his spirit. God has instilled in us a thirst. Okay, what does that mean? It's part of our hardwiring. Theologians will say God has created man as a religious creature. We are religious by our very nature. It's part of our hardwiring. You can change out the software to use our Silicon Valley language, right? But the hardwiring remains. You're going to worship in the Buddhist religion, the Christian religion, the Hindu religion. That's the software. The hardware remains. You might say, I don't know. I know some people that aren't very religious. Really? You give me one hour to examine their life and I'll show you all their religion. Okay, you show me an atheist, and I'll show you some of the most religious people I know. Okay, an atheist, oh yeah. Now, you say, but they don't believe in God. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. Religion means relationship. Religion comes from a Latin word, relationship. We are created for relationship. Okay, and this is why people live together, move near each other, want to be with family. Very rare do you get someone who wants to move out into the middle of nowhere and just sit by themselves for the rest of their lives. They yearn for relationship. But you get someone like that, you know what happens when they go crazy. So you, they yearn for relationship to develop as a human being. And so there's... there is their most important relationship for them is not just the relationship with fellow man, but relationship with their creator, 
right? Relationship with the creator and the fellow creature. We are created for a horizontal and vertical relationship, one and the same, and you can't have one without the other if you want them to be healthy. The next paragraph says, we also travel with others at our side to lead and teach, for the journey of faith takes place within a community. Do you see that? Within a community. Whose culture gives form, expression, and witness to the presence of God as a living reality within it. Look at the last line of that paragraph. Individualistic Christianity is a self-contradiction. I like that. Individualistic Christianity is a self-contradiction that is foreign to the Christian mind. Now, you'll find it today in modern forms of Christianity, but you won't find this in ancient Christianity, this individualistic idea. As a result of the Reformation and uh, the Enlightenment and all various developments or degradations in Western culture. Page five, second paragraph there. The church realizes this communal understanding of Christianity, most particularly in the liturgical synaxis. Now, I like theologians, but I really get bothered by them when they use fancy flute and high flute and words. Who's going to understand this? This is, for, this is a catechism for catechumens. Can you use a word like that? So, Synaxis. Synaxis is a Greek word which means gathering together. So gathering. Why don't they just put gathering? It drives me nuts. Okay, so particularly in the liturgical gathering, the liturgical gathering, divine worship is not simply a pious support to individual devotion. I like this. It is the arena in which we experience the kingdom. Okay, this is why Sunday service is so important. So when I say, ah, do I have to do church? Do I need to go every Sunday? Well, it depends. I mean, do you want to be a Christian? I mean, do you, do you want to develop in your spiritual life? Or just kind of, is this kind of just a, you know, a, another tangent on your life? If that's what's going to be, then yeah, go to church when you like. You know, go to the gym, you go to church, whatever, <laughs> I don't know. But if you want to be transformed by the power of God, then you need to be in an environment which transforms. And that environment is the liturgical gathering of the Christians together. When Christians gather together, there's an energy, there's a power. Have you ever been with somebody, that you, another fellow Christian, in the midst of a world, an area where there's not Christians, right? Maybe your workplace. And there's this, there's this suddenly you're refreshed. There's a sense that it's like you're energized. You're strengthened. There's a joy there all of a sudden. What is that? That's the presence of the Holy Spirit. And if you want to experience that in a massive way, get 5, 10, 50 Christians together praying to the Lord. And then you experience the power of God in the community in a way that is just ineffable, unexplainable. You can't describe it. Next uh, section there, consequences of faith. Consequences. Of faith. When God gives himself to believers, he works a transformation in us. Okay? When God gives himself to believers, he works a transformation in us. So what's going to happen when someone comes and encounters God and enters into relationship with God is God doesn't leave them how they are. They're going to change. They're going to develop. They're going to be transformed or better maybe restored to what they were intended to be. Okay? Look at the last line there of that paragraph. Thus true faith, which is the knowledge of God, never remains a detached intellectual exercise. So not just something that's heady. It's something you're going to think about and see what happens and, oh, yeah, oh, that was good, good. No, it changes and transforms every aspect of our existence. While the liturgical gathering, synaxis, is the primary way in which the church expresses and renews its communal faith, the daily life of the believer is the principal arena in which personal faith is exercised. So we gather together on Sunday or a major feast day. 
But your faith is then exercised when you leave the community and go out into the world. The normal course of maturing faith leads to this call going outward into the community, which receives the gospel. When, when you find a Christian who does not want to spread the faith, when there is a Christian who, who wants to just keep it to himself and not share it, then this is a Christian who has not grown into his faith. He is not really yet a full-grown Christian. He does not yet really live and experience and understand what he has. Faith in Christ should make a difference not only for the individual believer, but also for the society as a whole. Again, Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Abraham was called, it said, for the sake of the nations. He was called from the nations for the nations because God is a loving father of all humanity. All humanity is made in the image likeness of God. But some children had become estranged and need to be brought back into the family. This is why St. Paul tells us in uh, his first letter to me, God desires all men to be saved. He desires all men to be saved. Look at the last line of the third paragraph there. Through them, that is through Christians, the world created and loved by God is transformed by the action of the Holy Spirit into a new creation. So it's the Christians who have been transformed by God, who then go out in the world and become God's presence in the world, and then are able to transform the world through the power of God. Look at the last paragraph on that page. For many, the life of faith may be part of existence added to or superimposed onto quote unquote real life, right? It's, it's one of the things you do. I go to church, I go to the gym, I do this, I do that. I'm a Christian on Sunday, I'm a, uh, a gym enthusiast on Monday and Thursday. I go play, I, I'm a golf player on Fridays. Right? They've got these a schizophrenic world. Their, their world is a, is a big pie cut into slices, and rarely do they inter, interface. However, for the Christian, knowing God is so intrinsic to living a human life, and living in God is so integral to our very being that without him we are not fully alive. We become complete persons through our relationship with God and others as we experience it in the faith community. In Christ, we realize the true purpose of our nature as our humanity is completed and fulfilled. Henceforth, being human means being destined for divinity. Right? If God is our Father, then we, we yearn for that relationship with the divine creator. Now, this doesn't mean destined for divinity in the sense of we become gods like the Mormons talk about, but destined for divinity, destined for God. Led by the power of the Holy Spirit to be completely transformed after the model of him who fills all in all, Ephesians 1.23. Okay? Now, you have there uh, a little picture there of the Theotokos. There's a great example of what, why did the, the authors put that right there? As that image for you to meditate upon. What Christian was more transformed into the image of Jesus Christ than Mary? Right, who heard the word of God and accepted God's word. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, God came to dwell within her. And then she immediately went out into the world and shared the presence of God with those around her. I remember Elizabeth. She went to see Elizabeth. And then, but that wasn't it. That was intended to bring about the birth of Christ into the world. And this is what we're all called to do, to hear the word of God, to accept it, May it be done to me according to your word. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, the word of God dwells within us. And then we go out of the world and we are the presence of God to the world. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. We have Christ within us, but that's not it. We're not just supposed to go out and people get warm, fuzzy feelings and say, wow, I really like it when you're around. No, they are to be transformed like we were. They are to hear words of God from us. And from the word of God they hear from us, they can then say, 
let it be done on me according to their word, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, God comes and dwells with them. And through that, all of the world is transformed. Okay, so then that's the prologue. A lot of great stuff in there, right? Well, that's what this whole book is about, volume one. You're going to see as you read through volume one now, this is uh, an unpacking of that wonderful prologue. So let's look at chapter one now, page nine. The mystery of God. God is a mystery. Until we admit this, we cannot truly know him. So the, the catechism begins by giving us a little bit of a caution. The catechism is not going to tell us about God. It's not going to tell us about the 10 things about God so that we now know who God is and we're fine, we can move on. It begins by telling us that God in, the, in his essence is ultimately unknowable. So we begin, and this is something that's very emphasized in the Judeo-Christian tradition. It's emphasized in the early church by the fathers. You hear it in St. Paul's writings. And we still emphasize this very strongly in the East, that God is a mystery. God is a mystery. Now, a mystery is something that you, or you yearn to know more about. But you might think of a mystery like a mystery novel. You know, you can, oh, it's something in the end, you figure it out and you got it solved. No, God in the end is infinite, right? So there, there is no end to the mystery. So the more you learn about God, the more you realize you don't know. And this is true knowledge. Right? You might hear a very wise man. So you ask him some questions. Well, I'm not really sure about that. I don't, well, you have two or three PhDs. How can you not know? The more someone learns, the more they know, the more they realize how little they know, right? All right. Uh, so look at the last line of that paragraph. And so what we do know of God comes from his revelations to humanity through our history. So if we want to know God, who is he? What is he? How do we know it? Well, you can't just sit there and think really hard. How do you know God? I already said it. You look at what he's done. How do you know a man? You know, by, you know him by what he's done, right? You, if a guy walks up to your door with a big truck and some pipes and a pipe wrench in his hand, who is he, the electrician? I mean, he's the plumber, right? If you, if you walk into a, a building and a guy's uh, in some, you know, a blue uh, heavy denim outfit and he's mopping the floor, you think he's the, the president of the company or is he maybe the, the janitor, right? You see a guy walk by in a fancy suit, and like five other guys trailing behind him, writing everything he does. Well, that must be one of the executives there, right? You know someone by observing what they do and listening to their words, right? You listen to someone speak, you listen to what they say, you look at what they do, their pattern in life, and you learn who they are. You see that guy down by the lake, Fisherman. Right? What is he? Well, he's an electrician, I think. No, he's a, he's a fisherman, right? You see a guy who shows up uh, with, uh, uh, you know, electrical wires and things. He's, he's an electrician. We know a man, we know somebody by watching what they do and listening to their words. And so this is how we know God. We can't grasp in, in his fullness. It's impossible. But what we can do is look at what he's done in the past. And through that, we have a sense we can begin to reach out and, and feel the presence of God in our life through faith. Now, having said that, I want to encourage you then to also, not only in this catechism class, but I want you also to do some other studying. We have a Bible study on Wednesday nights, which is the, tomorrow night. If you have not yet been participating in that, you're going to want to go back and listen to the recordings, starting with Genesis, okay? Starting with Genesis, where you're going to hear the, the history of, of God saving his people, what we call salvation history. We're doing a study right now. We're going from Genesis all the way to the New Testament, hopefully by the time we get to Nativity, Christmas. And so that will be a very important companion study for you, not only looking at this stuff from a, a, a theological kind of systematic standpoint, which is what we're doing now, but also looking at it in the story, in the story, not just in the, in the systemization. And the story there is recorded, of course, in the Holy Bible. All right, so then, 
The next paragraph there, first line, from the beauty and order of nature, thinkers have argued to the existence of a creating principle. So from what's called natural reason and natural law, you look around, right? And you look at the beauty of things. You look at the complexity of things. You, you look under a microscope and you see, you see things that are so beyond our, our, uh, our, our ability to, to rationally grasp it. And we say, wow, there must be a creator who created all of this, right? So rational thinkers have come to the conclusion that by looking at nature very carefully, you can see that this is a creation that has a rational mind behind it, a creator. But faith requires a leap beyond this. So you can come, if you, if you look at nature and you study science real carefully, you can come to a point where you realize there's got to be a God. Okay, there's just no way. There's got to be a God. So you can acknowledge the fact that a God exists. But that's just the beginning. This is not the fullness of faith. You've, you've looked at his creation. You've looked at his work, what he's done. And you come to a realization that he exists and something about him. But you don't yet have relationship. You've acknowledged the existence, but you don't have relationship. You might see somebody at a distance and you acknowledge they exist. You see them, you learn something about them, but you have relationship with them. So faith is that leaping into the embrace of the God that you've now realized exists. Faith is leaping in to his embrace and becoming one with him. Faith requires a leap beyond this to the knowledge of a loving and holy creator. Look at the last uh, three sentences there, the paragraph. The testimony of various religions agrees on several attributes of God. Our name for the supreme being, he is holy, meaning that he is completely other than us. He is in infinite and transcendent. He is also good and loving to such a degree that we often call what is good, quote, godlike. Right. So religions in general agree that God is other. He is holy, kadosh in Hebrew, set apart. He's different from us. And yet there's a, there's a relationship, as we're going to see. But he is different. So what we want to make sure we avoid is anthropomorphizing God, right? That's where you think God is changing. God does not change. That is the, one of the most important distinctions between the creator and the creature. The creator does not change. The creature does. Okay? All right. Next page, page 10. Just what is mystery, then? What is mystery? We already talked about the idea, and we have a basic sense of the idea in, in English, but we might think of mystery as something that we don't know. Okay, that's basically the idea. But we often think of mystery in English as something that we can come to know. When we're talking about mystery in the Christian theology, we're talking about something which is, in its essence, unable to be grasped in its fullness. We acknowledge that it is beyond us, and that is the beginning of wisdom. When we realize that the thing is beyond our ability to grasp it, it's only then that we're able to begin to get a sense of it. It's when we think we've got it, oh, I, I can wrap this one up in a package and I can put it in a box, I understand it. You've completely missed the point, right? You've got yourself a pagan god in a box, okay? So, there's a beautiful statement that God says to Job. And this is in the last paragraph on page 10. Where were you when I founded the earth, Job? Huh? Tell me if you have understanding. Right? This is Job 38 verses 2 and also 4. Uh, this is a beautiful statement there in the book of Job. Job is wondering why is God doing the things he's doing? And finally God comes on the scene in the book of Job and says, Job, um, were you there when I created the world? No. All right. So have you ever walked in the depths of the sea? No. Do you know where the rain comes from, Job? No. Do you know how the, I know you have donkeys and, and sheep and you help them give birth, you know, during lambing season, but do you ever wonder who helps the deer give birth? And Job begins to realize that, He's trying to ponder things that are beyond him. And he simply covers his mouth, right? He's silenced in the awe of the immensity, infinity of the mystery. Page 11. 
page 11, first full paragraph there. The unknown is frightening, but mystery is not simply the unknowable. It is also the hope that what is veiled can be uncovered, at least within the limitations of our nature. St. Paul was able to write, quote, God gave me the commission to preach among you his word in its fullness. That mystery hidden from ages, the generations past, but now revealed in his holy ones. Colossians 1, 25 to 26. This is, he's talking about how the Old Testament is revealed in the new, right, the new covenant. Hidden yet revealed. You see that subtitle there? We should not despair of knowing anything about God because he does reveal some of the mystery to us. This itself is an aspect of the mystery, how and why the unknowable chooses to communicate himself to us. Quote, God causes the changes of the times and seasons, makes kings and unmakes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who understand. He reveals deep and hidden things and knows what is in the darkness, for the light dwells within him. For the light dwells with him. There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. This is Daniel chapter 2 when he's talking to Nebuchadnezzar. It's a beautiful uh, section there, Daniel. Okay, so then turn to page 13, top of the, the top there, page 13. In the anaphora in our liturgical gathering, during the anaphora, the prayer in the middle of the liturgy, the anaphora of the divine liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, which we pray every Sunday, we still pray the same thought, quote, you are God, ineffable. That is, uh, you, you can't speak, word, there are no words to describe, right, ineffable. Inconceivable, that is, you can't fully grasp. Invisible, you can't fully see. Incomprehensible, ever existing, and yet ever the same. And yet ever the same. Do you see that? Ever the same. Very important principle of Christian theology. God does not change. All right, so we can know something about him. He does reveal himself. But how has he revealed himself then? How has he revealed himself in salvation history? Look at paragraph 13, or page 13. Page 13. Image of the bright cloud. The surprising ways God has appeared illustrate the fullness of his nature. The glory of God often appears as a cloud, signifies both clarity and darkness. When God made his covenant with Abraham, a trance fell upon Abram and a deep, terrifying darkness enveloped him, Genesis 15, 12. When God gave the law to Moses, quote, the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses from the midst of the cloud, Exodus 24, 16. The Lord appeared to the people of Israel as a cloud, leading them from Pharaoh through the desert to the promised land. The prophet Ezekiel described the presence of the Lord in the temple, quote, the cloud filled the inner court the glory of the Lord rose from over the cherubim to the threshold of the temple. The temple was filled with the cloud, and all the cloud was bright with the glory of the Lord, Ezekiel 10.4. When the Lord Jesus was transfigured in glory on Mount Tabor, he and the disciples were overshadowed by a bright cloud, Matthew 17.5. Page 14, second paragraph. The image of the cloud has been used widely to represent the mystery of our relationship with God. But God has revealed himself to people in other ways too. God spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. This simple statement shows how mystery does not hide but reveals. We encounter God in the most ordinary human experiences. Many theophanies, that is manifestations of God, are in scripture, some with fire, earthquake, storm. Of course, these are only simple images since he is not one of those things. One of the most powerful theophanies in the Old Testament is the gentle appearance of God to Elijah on Mount Horeb. Elijah is told that God will pass by. A strong wind, strong and heavy wind, an earthquake, a fire sweeps through. But God was not in any of these. After the fire, a still small voice. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in the mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. This is uh, First Kings or Third Kings, depending on your translation titles, your books. 
The Lord spoke to him there, the still small voice in our God speaking. It is our God speaking to our innermost being in quiet and gentleness. Page 15. The icon of the invisible. Now, the word icon here, the image. Icon is just the Greek word for image. Icon, image. Okay, so image of the invisible. Okay, you get the sense there what they're trying to say with their title. As Christians, we believe that the fullness of the revelation of God is in our Lord Jesus Christ, whom we confess as, quote, begotten of the Father before all ages, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, of one essence with the Father through whom all things were made. This is the Nicene Creed. Thus, Jesus himself is the only adequate image of God. Whoever has seen him has seen the Father, he says to Philip in John 14, 9. For he is the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1, 15. So what does that tell you? It tells you something about if you want to know God, you've got to know what he's done, right? You have to know what he does, what he says, and the most, the fullness of his revelation to man is his incarnation, his incarnation. Next paragraph there, right in the middle, says, quote, no one has ever seen God. The only one who is the same as God, the only begotten of the Father, he has made him known. So it is Jesus who reveals the invisible God to us. Jesus is the the revelation of the Father. Look at the next paragraph. This revelation in Christ, in Christ does not make God transparent to us. So you might say, well, okay, so if we've seen Jesus, we know Jesus, then we know God. Okay, I mean, it's fine. Well, it says, as Christians, we accept the Lord Jesus Christ as the fullness of the revelation of God. Yes. Yet on the Feast of the Transfiguration, August 6th, the church sings that on Mount Tabor, Jesus revealed to his disciples only, quote, as much of his glory as they could behold. Further, his disciples, quote, beheld as much of his glory as they could. God's self-revelation to us is limited, not by his love, but by our inability to grasp him. So it's not like God's hiding stuff from us. It's just simply that there is only so much a finite mind, a finite creature is able to absorb. And so God reveals to us as much as we are able to comprehend. And we then, if we are willing, are able to comprehend as much as he has revealed to us. There's a relationship there. Next paragraph. We can never know God completely. right? He's infinite. We're finite. But we can always know him increasingly better. So what that means is that we don't just simply, we, we get to a point where we know God, and we're at a certain limit, we hit a threshold, and then there it is. No, the more time we spend with him, the more we learn about what he has done, the more we learn to trust in him, the more we, re- we come into relationship with him, the closer we draw to him, the better we understand him. We can never know God completely, but we can always know him increasingly better. As he draws us to himself, we lose our, our childish and faith, our, our uh, childish and faith distorting concept of God. We grow to know him as loving and compassionate, giving himself to us through Jesus Christ, revealed in the quote, mystery of mysteries, the divine liturgy. Here, The church enters into the saving life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We glimpse the depth, the breadth, the reality of God's love for us and his mystical union with us. While not replacing the broader relationship with God and humanity, the liturgy becomes the transforming reality of that relationship. One may intellectually search for God, but he has already found us and united himself to us in ways beyond our human understanding. We can hear the still, small voice of God speaking to our inner being across the ages with his timeless voice of love and long to be, quote, worthy to partake with a pure conscience of his heavenly mysteries. This is what we say during the creed just before, or during, in the liturgy just before communion. 
and thus know him in a way which surpasses the limitations of our mind. And so it's in the midst of the liturgy, in the midst of our prayer, our singing, our smelling the incense, our hearing everyone else pray, that we suddenly are lifted up and experience faith as life. We are raised beyond our rational understanding, our reason, and are able to grasp and know him in a way that is ineffable. If you've ever experienced this in liturgy, you know what I'm talking about, where you begin to cry out of just utter joy. There's no words to describe it. This is that knowledge of God, the experience of God that goes beyond our rational being. And so we get a taste of the infinite, even though we are finite, in the midst of the liturgy. We may end this consideration of the meaning of mystery with a prayer that concludes the divine liturgy of St. Basil and expresses our desire to enter ever more deeply into the mystery of God. O Christ our God, the mystery of your plan has been completed and perfected as far as in us lay. We have commemorated your death. We have seen the figure of your resurrection. We have been filled with your endless life. We have enjoyed your delights, which cannot be exhausted, and of which we beg you to deem us worthy in the age to come to the grace of the Father who has no beginning and of all and your all holy, good, and life-giving spirit. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. I would like you to think of a few words here to ponder as uh, and I ask you to then uh, come ask any questions you might have. We've heard this idea of limit, right? There's this mystery that we can only know so much. And yet I want to add something to what the author said. We're going to learn about baptism, chrismation, and the Eucharist, through which, as the author said here, we become members of the body of Christ. Who is it that knows the Father perfectly? Only Jesus Christ. And so you in yourself, I and myself, cannot know the Father. But as I am transformed through the sacraments into a member of the body of Christ, my mind is transformed and renewed. And I am able, through the eyes of Jesus, through the mind of Jesus, through the divine nature as we partake of, as St. Peter says in his second epistle, to begin to see the Father, to begin to see the Father and experience his love for us.